Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Father, we come into your presence asking for your anointing and blessing upon your word. We ask you, Lord, to bless those who receive it. And Lord, uh, anoint me that we might preach and teach the word of God with authority and spiritual depth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, in the days of the scriptures, the Old Testament and, uh, of course, the New Testament as well, we find that the Lord had those that he had set apart to teach his scripture and his word to those who might hear it and come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord, Redeemer, Savior and accept uh, that great sacrifice that he offered for us on the cross of Calvary to cleanse us from our sin. And so I basically have stuck with that kind of a teaching. Today I'm going to drift a little bit away from that. I know the Lord has laid it upon my heart that the condition that our land is in and the people who are trying to serve the Lord are facing today is very difficult. And I want to take you to the scriptures. I'm not going to talk about uh, political parties or uh, such like, but I am going to point out what God says is going to be happening in the last days. It's uh, unusual if I don't have someone ask me within a, a day or two uh, whether or not uh, I believe that the Lord is coming soon, whether or not that we're living in the last days. Uh, what do you think, Pastor, about all this stuff that's going on? And uh, uh, are, are you really uh, going to come against that? And, and are you going to uh, be quiet about it? Or are you going to give us some instruction? Well, I'm not going to get into the political arena, but I am going to give you some instruction about what God gave us in the Scripture that we might be prepared to face the last days. Do I believe that we're nearing the last days? Yes, I do. Well, when do you think the Lord's coming, Pastor? I think he's coming when the Lord's time is set by the Heavenly Father. I remember that he told the disciples that nobody knows the time of his return, and apparently he did not either, but he said we would know the signs, and we would know the times, and that we were to be on our guard and be prepared for the return of the bridegroom for his bride. And I don't know about you, but I'm anxious for that time to come. Yes, it could come soon. And yes, it could be a season of time yet. But compared to where we have been in the earlier days of history of this country, we are in a very difficult and ungodly state before the Heavenly Father. And I want to tell you what he said was going to happen to his people in the last days. First, he said there's going to be a great falling away. That means that people who have stood in faith, believed the Word of God, uh, lived it to the best of their ability, uh, will grow discouraged and they'll uh, buy into false doctrines and they'll begin to believe uh, uh, that uh, they've been taught uh, wrongly. And uh, in any, many cases, they really have been. But the truth of the matter is, the Word of God gives us explicit ideas and direction about the conditions that the old world is going to be in before the bridegroom comes back. And we want to talk about that today. It's amazing to me that many believers that have uh, had a born-again experience, they know and love the Lord with all of their heart, but they're totally uh, ignorant of what the Bible says about so many things. And of course that has to be because they don't read the scripture and study the scripture as they should. And so I want to prod you a little bit today to hear me. Uh, I want you to take note of what the 
The word is telling us as Paul was teaching Timothy what he was to teach the people. And I want you to listen carefully to the lesson. And then I want you to begin to analyze how prepared and how knowledgeable you are about the Word of God and what God says about His people, about His presence, about His judgments, about His return, and so forth. So it's important for us, first of all, to urge you, Open your Bibles. Don't wait till you hear another Bible study. Don't wait until you go to church next Wednesday or next Sunday. But get down and spend at least a few minutes every day in the Word. And I think you'll be amazed at how well the prophets of old and the apostles of the New Testament were able to predict exactly where we are today in the time frame of God's historical intervention in behalf of his people, that they might be set free from their sin, born again into the kingdom of God through the sacrificial offering of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I want you to know this before I get into the word. You need to understand the battle that's going on today about so-called conservatives and uh, the liberals and then the uh, extreme liberals, etc. And you look at it and you say, I'm confused. What in the world is going on? I want to tell you what's going on. And I want you to listen carefully because the words I'm going to teach you today uh, are going to back up what I'm telling you. First of all, there's only two real powers on this earth. Oh, we have all kinds of energy and supernatural power, evil power, ungodly power, mystical power. And we talk about all of the different kinds of power we have. But there's only really two powers on this earth. One is the power of righteousness and purity and good and uh, uh, holiness and uprightness before the Heavenly Father. And the other is the intent and the power of the satanic powers of hell being led by Satan himself. And everyone on this earth is influenced and guided and directed and led by one of those spirits. Either the spirit of good and, and wonderful blessing and peace and tranquility, a promise of victory ahead, or... They're led by the power of the enemy, which is determined to destroy anything that's righteous, anything that's pure and upright. He's, if, he's going to destroy anyone who dares to preach about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, from the 1950s, this old preacher has been telling uh, those who listen to him that the day is coming, and I said, I believe it's going to come in my generation, in my lifetime, when we're going to see the Christian people of the U.S. come to a place of attack from the enemy like we've never seen before, and we're going to see the powers of hell try to destroy the Word of God, and anybody who dares to preach the Word of God, or even dares to speak uh, about the fact uh, uh, that they're a Christian, or that they uh, serve the Lord, and they believe uh, in the pathway that God put forth for us to live by throughout His Scriptures. And so we are at that point. Now, within the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen a drastic change. And the power of the enemy is coming against us. And anybody, whether you're a born-again believer or not, if you are a person that looks to them like that you are uh, serving the Lord. And by the way, the enemy knows who God's people are, who his chosen people are. And the enemy is doing everything he can to discredit, to somehow or another punish, uh, to cause uh, uh, us to be in a position where we have to defend ourselves constantly. And we found out a long time ago, didn't we, that 
you and I can defend ourselves very good. And so we've got to get close to the Lord and walk where we can sense and understand the Spirit of the Lord and the Word of God and where we can lean upon our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ to lead us into victory and into a place wherein we will not be destroyed, our faith will not be weakened, and we will not be about those numbers or within those numbers uh, that are going to uh, put their faith aside and they're going to uh, turn to the uh, ideas of the enemy and they're going to have a great falling away from the purity and the righteousness and the power of Almighty God as given unto those who will trust in Him and will walk a, a born-again experience in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God that was given unto us to deliver us from our sin. And if we don't need that today, we never have needed it. I want you to understand something, beloved. The enemy today is doing everything he can to mimic what God said was going to come to pass and it was going to happen before Jesus returns for his bride. Now, I know there's a lot of doctrines out there that say, oh, no, 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 we're going to go up and be with the Lord before any of this comes our way. Well, you better read Matthew 24, and the first thing you need to know is that the third verse in that book says, do not be deceived. And then Jesus goes on, gives a chronological insight into what would become the history of his people from the time of his crucifixion and resurrection until the time when he returns for his bride. And I think you need to look at what Jesus said to be careful about and to listen to what he speaks. And then today I'm going to back up what Jesus said with what some Others taught uh, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to try to uh, let you realize that according to what's happening in the world today, they want one world government. Well, when Jesus comes back and takes over this old world, we're going to have one world government, and it's going to be holy and righteous and pure. Before that happens, we're going to see that the, the false prophet that the, the beast of, of iniquity and ungodliness and, and uh, the powers of the Antichrist uh, are going to be prevalent and they have become prevalent in our midst as we even open the Word of God today. I think as I begin to read, you'll see and understand. And so you need to know that we've got all the powers of hell against the powers of God, and the powers of God are released, folks, not to, uh, by some great experience that we see in the sky, but by the word of God that goes forth from the mouth of those who have been anointed to teach and preach it and live it. And it's important, beloved, I think that you understand that when you see all the confusion, all of the hatred, all of the uh, false accusations, and then you see those who have done right uh, and have lived right, uh, falsely accused, uh, and they're considered evil, and the evil ones uh, are presenting themselves as the righteous ones. We need to open our eyes, our ears, and our heart to understanding where we really are in the scope of God's prophecies and teaching through His Word. And we're so thankful that we can talk about it today. There's a lot of false prophets out there. I don't know if you've uh, heard it yet or not, but... Uh, this last week, maybe two weeks ago now, uh, we find that uh, uh, a great uh, church, powerful church, that uh, has preached the word, almost all of it, uh, 
Basically, they preached and believed everything other than the events of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But they have now a leader that declares that he believes that, yes, homosexuality is a sin, but it won't keep you out of heaven. And this man is the head of a large Protestant so-called denomination here on this earth today. Think about that. You know, when Jesus was here and teaching his word, it really wasn't the heathen that was so dangerous for him. Oh, yes, we had the evil kings and the evil governments and all of that was there, of course. But we find that the ones that really betrayed him and really brought about the things that caused his hard place of life as he preached the word of the Father and lived righteously without sin in the face of ungodly, terrible, powerful temptations and attack of the enemy trying to destroy him and cause him to fall from the grace of God. Well, he did not do that, did he? And yet today we've had people that uh, once walked with the Lord, knew the presence of God, had experience of the beautiful works of the Holy Spirit, and they have grown weary because of the attack of the enemy. And they believed the lies of Satan, the false prophets, and I want you to know that many, not all, but many of the great uh, so-called Preachers that are on the air today and on TV today are not genuine, born-again instruments anointed of God. Many of our pulpits are filled with the implant of satanic teaching and satanic leadership that is motivated by the enemy himself. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples, you need to be careful, don't be deceived. And I've talked with a number of people that just tell me, oh, this man is such a wonderful man, he's a man of God, etc., etc. But when you find out what he really is, he is a tool of the enemy, teaching false doctrine saying the right things to a degree, but then poisoning the word that he speaks from the Bible with the doctrine and ideas and spiritual exemption, if you please, from responsibility to live righteously, and distorts the word to the point that these who have not read the word are not even close to understanding what the Word really says. So many of our people today, because of the modern technology of the age in which we live, are able to hear uh, so-called gospel preaching all 24 hours a day around the clock anywhere in the world. But you know what? Many of those people are listening to the false prophets listening to the false doctrines, and because it sounds so good, are believing it and are turning away from the true word of God that was given unto us by the anointing of the Holy Spirit in capturing the scripture both in the Old Testament era and the New Testament era from the time that Jesus was born. We need to open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts. And I hope this will help you today. Now, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Paul is speaking to Timothy. He's telling him what he needs to preach to those that are turning to him for leadership in their congregational setting. And 
it's uh, you know, and I th I think most of you know that uh, after Jesus was crucified, rose from the dead, uh, the day of Pentecost came, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and the 120 in the upper room. I think uh, you're aware that from that time, uh, the Word of God has been presented to us in such a way that we can understand the Old Testament and we can because we understand and have the guidance of, of the New Testament that we can look to today. Well, the Old Testament we don't need anymore, right? Oh, no! Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the Old Testament. I came to fulfill it. And because he fulfilled it, it opened the door for him to become the sacrifice for our sin and redeem us from the jaws of the law of sin and death and give us that new anointed power and authority and purity, righteousness, holiness, whereby we can live above and beyond sin. And we can live in obedience unto the Lord and the word that he gave unto us throughout the word, both in the Old and in the New Testament. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. We are living in the last days. Perilous times are here. Every time that we think there may be a little span of uh, quiet and peace in the world order, we find that uh, if it comes to be sort of uh, put down in one area, it pops up in another and another. And then we get to uh, have to deal with that kind of a situation, and then it pops up again and again and again, and it multiplies. And we're going fast down that road of perilous times, folks. Verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Oh, what do you see today? I'm the only one that I have to satisfy. It doesn't matter what you do or think. I'm going to do my thing. And I'm going to do it because I want to do it. And I'm going to do it because I'm not going to uh, be in a place where I'm going to bow or yield to somebody else's ideas. Lovers of themselves. Me first. Me first. No, I'm not talking about political situations. I'm talking about people who are affiliated perhaps with no one and people who are closely affiliated with some religious organization. And uh, believe it or not, there was a day in our land where this country was not involved with worrying about a bunch of heathen, anti-God religions. Today, our country is saturated with them, multitudes of them, and we dare not speak anything about them because we don't dare tell anybody that they're wrong. But they are wrong. And so we come to a place where we begin to listen and we invite them in and we cause them to come in and, and uh, mingle among our congregations. And it isn't very long until that congregation that was dedicated and committed to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all of their heart to, to the very best of their ability are so indoctrinated from within the flock by the insiders that are there as the pawns of the devil and teaching and preaching and exemplifying the ungodly evil works of the satanic practices of evil. Verse 3, without natural affection. Oh, I didn't finish verse 2. Have you ever seen so much jealousy, so much coveting? I want what you have. We have fallen into the same trap that old Israel fell in in the Old Testament days. We want to be like everybody else. And God said, I want a people that is unique unto myself, 
that is different than the rest of the ungodly world that will be faithful unto me and I want a people that I can look to and know that they are the example of what righteousness on this earth is supposed to be. But we listen and we hear it again and again and again and pretty soon we say, well, I don't see what's so wrong with this doctrine. I don't see what's so wrong with that doctrine. I mean, after all, God does love everybody. Lie. God says he hates some people. Oh, pastor, I'm telling you the truth. Now, I'm not going to try to prove that to you today. You can read it for yourself. Boasters and proud. Oh, we have people that are, uh, and we see them every day on TV. We see them every day in the gr grocery stores and the shopping centers and, and uh, how important they are. And they're so proud and they know everything and don't know anything. Blasphemers. This country is filled with blasphemers. Now we used to think that blasphemy was uh, curse words or taking God's name in vain, which it is. But the blaspheming that we have today are those who say, well, you know, yeah, I know Jesus was a great man and I know that he had a wonderful message, but you know there's other ways to get to heaven. Well, that's not what God says. But multitudes of people who claim to be Christians today believe that and they welcome into their presence, into their worship services, into their organizational structures of, of leadership. They welcome in those that are right straight out of the pits of hell and they speak such, oh, such pleasing words and they're so capable of flattery and, and uh, uh, painting a beautiful picture. But their message leads to eternal death. Disobedient to parents. This generation is the most disobedient and rebellious generation of all of history. What do you know? Oh, Mom, you're old-fashioned. Dad... Get with it. You need to get involved in the new work, in the new world, in the 21st century. You need to get involved. No, what they need to do is to come to a point they recognize that the 21st century and the majority of the powers that be here in this world today are determined to destroy them and to put them down, and to cause them to fail and to lose out in the position of the kingdom of God that God had planned for them. Oh, well, if God planned it for them, then it has to be. It does. The last time I looked, God said he made man in his own image. And that included, my friend, he gave man the freedom. He gave man the ability. He gave the man the desires to live righteously and to walk uprightly and to be an example of the glory of God, the Father, the creator of all things. And today, there are more doctrines, more cults, more anti-God preaching, more pastoral impersonators that are not of God. They're false shepherds. We can't name them all. But we know they're there. Every time we turn around, we're running into one of them. We're hearing from one of them. We're being abused and, and uh, persecuted by one of them in one way or another. Unthankful. You know, there was a time not too long ago, within the last 20 or 30 years, where when you did something for someone, they would say, thank you. I really appreciate that. 
You don't hear those words very often today. And once in a while, you'll find someone does something and uh, they are thankful. My wife and I was walking into a restaurant the other day and uh, uh, there was uh, uh, this uh, family, this lady and her husband, I assume, uh, with two or three little children and uh, they were behind us. And so we held the door open and let them enter ahead of us and they went in with their nose held high walked in as slow as they could walk and stood there and waited to be seated. They never even looked at us and never did say, well, thank you. But on the other side of that, we were going into a restaurant again, not the same one, and we got ready to, well, actually we were in the restaurant and we were ready to leave, and we got ready to leave, and we get to the door, and here's this little seven or eight year old boy saw us coming, and he runs, grabs the door, opens the door, and throws it open and holds it until we can get outside without having to open the door. A, A sign of courtesy and respect and appreciative of things that few people are appreciative of today. So there's still hope. There's still a few, but oh, they're becoming fewer and fewer. Don't you be one of them. Disobedience to parents, unthankful and unholy. Now let's go to the next verse. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Don't we have all of that happening right now? We certainly do. Well, what does it got to mean? It means without self-control. They are controlled by powers and spirits and and, uh, uh, psychology, all the other stuff that Satan throws to them. And they have no self-control. They can't say, no, 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 I'm not going to walk in that. They say, oh, well, come on. You know, I'll be a part of your party. I'll I'll, I'll live uh, like you want me to live. I just want to be accepted. Not accepted, accepted. Not only that, verse 4 says, there's traitors. Heady. What does heady mean? It means they are brash know-it-all people who are high-minded. You can't tell them anything. They won't listen to anything you have to say. They have nothing to do but to present themselves in such a measure that I am going to have the floor. I'm going to have the uh, attention of all and uh, you're not going to have any impact in my presence whatsoever, I'm going to impact your presence to the point that you become totally insignificant. That's what uh, incontinent means. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. I don't know if you've been listening to the news at all. Many of you don't bother to listen to the news, but you'd learn a lot if you did about what the world is really like today. No, I'm not suggesting that you fall for its traps. You ought to be close enough to the Lord that you can watch and listen once in a while and say, wait a minute, that's a sign of the times. Wait a minute, the Bible told about that a long time ago, over 2,000 years ago. Jesus taught that was going to come. Well, what are we going to do about it? Verse 5. Having a form of godliness. Oh, we have so many today that have a smooth tongue. And they have, uh, I don't know how to describe it. They have a weird smile in their countenance. And they're oh so perfect and so wonderful. and, And they are so smooth. And they are, well, what they are, they're, they're, 
a con artist of life. They're pretending that the world in which they live is the greatest thing on earth when it's sure death and judgment and damnation for them when they breathe their last breath if they haven't made their self right with God. Now, what do we have? We go on. They have a form of godliness. Oh, Pastor Brother so-and-so, he's such a wonderful person. He's such, oh, he knows Bible back and forward. I mean, he knows it. I had that happen to me when I was pastoring a church. A man came in. Oh, he was so fluid and smooth talking. And, and uh, he could quote scripture after scripture. And I had people come to me in about four or five weeks and say, Oh, pastor, you need to make him an assistant pastor. I looked at them and I said, no, I don't think so. Why? Because I saw what he was. He was there for another few weeks and pretty soon the venom came out. And uh, this wonderful man that was so great and should be part of the leadership of the church suddenly had the cover ripped off. And they saw who and what and how evil he was. That same man tried to kill this pastor one day before the congregation ever saw anything in him. But for the intervention of Jesus, he would have killed me. Well, how can that happen? Well, it happens because deceivers and false prophets and evil practitioners are everywhere in our generation. Verse 6, 2 Timothy 3. For this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts. Now, you're going to say, oh, pastor, I see you're against women. No, not at all. I'm just telling you that there are women and there are men as well. But there are women that are evil to the core. And it's been my experience that when you find an evil woman, that that woman can be more evil and do more ungodly evil works than what any man that you would say is an unbeliever, ungodly, evil, has no place in the kingdom. But oh, they're able to present themselves in such a measure as to fool multitudes. Some of them are on TV. Some of them are in our churches. Paul said to Timothy, you watch out for them. You watch out for them. Now, I want to tell you a little secret. If you read the Word of God, you'll find that men sinned against God and broke the promises of, and the covenant of God that had been given unto them many times throughout the Scripture. But you will find that when Satan begins to want to do his dirty work, he nearly always, not always, but nearly always, finds a woman that he can influence. It started with Eve. No, Eve was deceived. Adam caved in and sinned. You think about that. You look at the cults and how many of them have women 
as the founder of the cult. Many of them today. Satan will work through the feminine gender. And now the move in our country is to do away with men, especially white men. I wonder why that is. And they're determined that they're going to take over the world. They're going to take over the government. They're going to take over the businesses. And everything that this world has to offer will be better off, they say. They say. If we can just get control. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Now there's no doubt that there are many of them that have the capacity. It's not every woman. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying Satan attacks the woman. And she doesn't even know it in many instances. Ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Oh, there's lots of things we can learn, lots of situations and, and details and uh, elements in this world that we'd like to know about and can find some sort of a, a degree of pleasure. There's a, a thing going on today that I think we need to look at. We have professional students. They never work. They don't intend to work. They live off of somebody else. Or they have somehow or another inherited uh, funds and situations that they can use. And uh, they do their own thing and all of that. And uh, that's, that's the way it works. They are a disgrace to the multitude, the majority of women who have good intentions, want to do the right thing want to uh, live the right way that uh, they should, want to be faithful to their husbands and to their children. And uh, it's, a, it's a minority, but it's a very loud minority that I'm talking about that wants to establish a feminine one world order because that is exactly the opposite of what Jesus, our Lord and Redeemer, is going to do when he returns here. And they want to set it forth and they want to tell the world, the Antichrist will come along and he'll tell the world, uh, you don't need to worry about Jesus. Uh, you know, I'm God. I'm God. And he will be able to have power to do things. There will be signs in the heavens that look so religious and pure, but they're there because of satanic power, not God's doing. It's something we need to be aware of. We're living in that attitude, that era of time today. Three or four days ago, maybe a week now, got an email with a picture of Jesus Christ in the middle of this stormy cloud that was all around him, and it looked exactly like we would picture Jesus as he was going up in the clouds to meet the Father, to be with the Father in our behalf. Oh, Pastor, that can't be. Oh, yeah, it was. We have the pictures of it. I've had several people say to me, well, do you think that was Jesus? No. When Jesus comes back, it's going to be like a flash of lightning. Boom. And he'll be visible everywhere around the world. Well, how can that be? Because he's the Son of God. Because he is now completely filled with the spirit of righteousness as he was when he lived here on this earth and holy as he was when he lived here on this earth. But the Bible tells us when they say he's over here, believe it not. Oh, he's down the street. No, no, 
No, don't believe that. Oh, well, I know he's not there because I saw him. Really? Oh, yeah. What did the Bible say? What did Jesus say? Don't believe it. It's a lie. Go on quickly now. Now, as James and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. They are men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Who was ja Janus and Jambres? They were Egyptian men who dared to come against Moses. Paid the price for it. Now, what does it mean to be reprobate? It means to be worthless. And especially worthless concerning the faith. There are a lot of people out there today that are reprobate in faith. Oh, they believe in God. They know that Jesus was born a virgin. And they believe that he was uh, brought forth at the hand of God. They believe he was a great prophet. But they're not going to talk about Jesus. They believe in God. But which God do they believe in? Do they believe in God Almighty? No. They believe in another God. And there are a lot of them. Verse 9. But they shall proceed no farther, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. As God dealt with those men that came against Moses. He'll deal with those who come against us. Verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Verse 11. Persecutions. Oh, one of the enemy's great and wonderful uh, lies that so many people believe. Well, you know, Pastor, we're not going to have to go through hard times because we're going to go up to be with the Lord before any of that happens. It's not what Jesus said. It's not what the prophets said. It's not what the apostles said. It's what some little milkmaid in Great Britain had a dream and saw everybody going up to be with the Lord. She told her so-called pastor, he thought it was wonderful, passed it on. And did you know that that's where the idea came that uh, the church is going to go up before the Great Tribulation? It's a lie. Verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Oh, but, yeah, well, they're not, I don't, I don't feel any persecution. I think if you don't, I think you should be a little bit concerned. Because if you don't have any persecution, you must not be reflecting much of the Lord Jesus Christ and the righteousness of Almighty God in your daily lifestyle. Pastor. You're so harsh. No, I'm saying it, and I'm saying it powerfully because many of us who are serving the Lord are confronted every day with the idea that if you serve Jesus, you won't be persecuted. He'll take care of everything. Then why did all of the disciples but one die because they dared to believe and refused to reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Redeemer. Verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men, verse 13, evil men and seducers are casting spells, and they shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
They will pass on lies and deceive multitudes because they are deceived and they don't even know they're deceived because of the condition of the world in which they live. And we're in that place today. Verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child, you know there are those who say, oh no, you don't need to worry about teaching your children anything. I'm going to wait till they're of age and they can make their own choice about their religions. What a lie. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. Think about that. Paul said of Timothy, I know you were trained from your childhood in the Word of God. And you knew the message of salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration. That means by the anointed breath of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly, totally equipped, in other words, furnished unto all good works. I have to close there because it's time for us to go to communion. Corinthians chapter 11, I read. I'm going to start with verse 23. For I received of the Lord, Paul says, that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood. That word testament means covenant. My commitment. 
that cannot be broken. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show, that means uh, that you reveal, acknowledge, declare, whatever word you want to use there, the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation, that means judgment, to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, not, not recognizing the holiness and the value of this act of communion that Jesus told us to keep in remembrance of him. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That word sleep means many have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Praise his wonderful name. Now with that, I think we understand well. We're going to take of the bread. And as we do, we're going to ask uh, that uh, the Lord bless it. Father, bless it, and acknowledge that it represents the flesh that was torn from the back of Jesus by the cruel Roman whips as he was tied to the whipping post. Father, we come and ask you to cleanse if there's any, any kind of darkness or sin or ungodliness, imperfection of spirit in our life. Purge us and make us clean afresh. Lord, we acknowledge that it was by this that you paid for our judgment and our sin and our sicknesses and infirmities and all of the things that come against us in this ungodly world. And so, Father, we ask you to bless as we eat of this in remembrance of the price Jesus paid at the whipping post for us. Let's eat together. Then we take the cup. He said, when you drink of this cup, you remember my shed blood. And as we take of it, we have to acknowledge that by the shedding of blood, and only by the shedding of blood, the blood of the sacrificial lamb of God, can cleanse us from our sin. Father, we acknowledge that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us drink together. Praise His name. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at Christian Living 101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. Or email Gene at Gene, with a G-E-N-E, Gene at ChristianLiving101.org.